Now, today's message title, if you take notes, is Worthy. And I love that we sang the, the song that had the worthy. We're talking about bringing God honor, bringing Him worth. And really, the word worthy is to add value to. Now, it's an interesting word, right? It's like in the Greek, and you do a little study there. The word worthy is kind of this idea of a scale, like you're balancing things out there. You're weighing something. I don't know if you've ever used a scale before, right? Um, maybe in chemistry, or maybe you were a street chemist um, using some scales at one point in time. But um, you're weighing things out. Now, what he's talking about here, Paul, he's saying live your lives in a manner that's worthy of the calling of Christ. And really what he's getting at is he's saying you should live in such a way that it, it matches what you say you believe. And we're going to unpack this in a little bit, but you need to know this, that the word worthy, when we're talking about live in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not that we're adding anything to the gospel, okay? Right? Christ's work is finished. It's a finished work. We receive his work, his atonement on the cross. We are forgiven. We're set free. We have salvation in him. But when we respond, we're, we're not adding anything, making it any more valuable. But what we're doing is we're saying, God, you're so good. I can't believe you die for me, that you'd forgive me, you'd cover my sins. And it's a response that I want to bring worth. I want to bring value, even though I know that it's not much, to you, to your name, so that people might know you. These past few days, um, we spent in Colorado, me, my wife, Louie, Melissa, my sister, um, and there's a, a pastors and leaders conference, and it was, it was good, it was refreshing, but there was a song that the worship team sung, and maybe some of you know it, I'll, I'll mess it up for sure, but it was by Brandon Lake, he wasn't there, but it was his song called Gratitude, I don't know if everyone heard of it. Well, there's a line in there that goes something like, I have nothing to bring, nothing fit for a king except for my hallelujah or something of that nature, right? And in that moment, for me, it, it really bothered me. And if I get a, not bothered because it's bad, but it bothered me because for me, like, I really want to bring everything to Jesus. Now, if I get emotional, I apologize, but man, I just, I want to bring everything to Jesus. I want to bring each and every one of you to Jesus. And what God, he met me in that moment, he said, but they're not yours to give. And, I, and it was a reminder, all I can give is my heart. All I can give is my everything. I can't give your heart to Jesus. I can't, I can't make you believe, but as it's been said, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you better believe that I'm going to lead you guys every week. If you're here, if you tune in online, anyone that I can, I'm going to lead you to the water, and I'm going to pray that you take a drink of the living water of Jesus and that you would see that he is worthy. He's worthy of everything. He's worthy, and he's worthy of everything. He's worthy of our praise. As Sam said, every breath we have is a gift from him. It's like every opportunity we have is something he's allowed us to do. Do you realize that you are alive today because God wanted you to be alive? Not because of an accident, right? Some of you are like, well, my parents, I was an accident. I was a surprise. You weren't a surprise to God. He knew who he was making in the womb. It doesn't matter if they planned it or not. He created you. It says that he knit you together in your mother's womb. Before there was even one day of your life, he had all of it planned out. Psalms, I think it's Psalms 149. It's pretty amazing. Go read it. It's like everything was planned out. God knew who he was making. He's making you. He's making me. He's making every single person. Every person in Israel. Every person that's attacking Israel. God knew who he was making. He knew why he made them, and he made them on purpose for a purpose. And the purpose, simply put, we find it in Ephesians or um, Colossians 1.16, rather, where it says is we are made by Him and for Him. We're made by Jesus. Everything was created through Him. We we're made for Him, to bring Him glory. Now, we often don't do that, though, do we? It's kind of the problem. It's this thing called sin, and we're not, no one's immune from it. I'm not immune to it. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together, and neither do you. Anyone who would claim to say, oh, I got it all together. I'm finally perfect, Nick. You're, the Bible says you're a liar. <laughs> First John talks about if you say you have no sin, you, you're a liar. And that's your sin right there. But we have sin, and Jesus loves us, and we want to say thank you. And I think our response is we want to bring worth and value and again, like I said, that song bothered me because I want to bring everything, but I realize I don't have much to bring other than my all. And I want to give my all to Jesus. 
And so I just want to encourage you as we read this, this study today, read this text, to so consider the same. I just want to bring it all to Jesus. I want to lay my life down for him because he laid his life down for me. And what he's calling us to do, he's not calling, some people he's calling, hey, you're going you're gonna to die for me, right? We see that through scripture. And I know that's scary, but some people he's calling you, hey, just go out there, be a good witness of me wherever you go, at your work, at your secular job. We've seen this stuff before in the Bible. Some of us were like, well, if I give my life to Jesus, I need to get a new job. And maybe so, but maybe God wants to use you right where you're at. Right? Think of Nehemiah. He was a cupbearer to the king of, um, of Persia or Babylon, which would be a whole 180. It'd basically be like he's not the king of Israel. He's the king of the people who are attacking Israel. And Nehemiah served him, and God used him in some pretty mighty extreme, awesome ways, and God will use you and me if we seek to live for Jesus. Worthy. Worthy. Live your lives in a way that is worthy. In the past five weeks or so, as we've gone over the first part of Philippians, we've seen Paul. He's the author here. He's a church planter. If you don't know, if you're just joining in today, hopping into Philippians, Paul He used to be Saul. He used to hate Jesus. He persecuted the church. He literally um, was standing there when, and he said he approved of the execution of this guy named Stephen, who was a Jesus freak at the time. And Saul, who was Paul or is Paul, right, didn't like Jesus, didn't believe in Jesus. And so he said, Yeah, go ahead and kill him. And so that was Saul. But then Jesus got a hold of him. And now all of a sudden, Paul, here in Philippians, man, he's, he's been on fire for Jesus. He's a Jesus freak, and he's actually the one in prison now for preaching Jesus. And he's in some pretty undesirable circumstances, I think we could say. I don't know anybody here or anyone at all who would be like, you know what, I'd really like to go spend a night or two years in jail. Nobody's like that, right? Maybe some crazy people out on the street. But nobody wants to go spend a night in jail. But Paul is in jail. Not only is he in jail, he's in jail because he was preaching the gospel. He's in chains. He's chained to a Roman guard, someone of the Imperial Guard, 24-7. So it's not just like, hey, he's, I mean, he's on house arrest too, so it kind of gives you this picture. But he has a Roman guard chained to him wherever he goes, whatever he does. And he was allowed to have guests. Timothy could come visit. Other people of Rome could come see how Paul's doing. He could encourage them, have a Bible study. But he's chained to a guard because he was preaching the gospel. He'd spend two years in there for preaching the gospel. And as we saw a couple weeks ago, he's hated by other Christian brothers for preaching the gospel. And that's the crazy weird thing. It's like, wait a second, you said Christian brothers hating another Christian brother. I know it might sound crazy to you, but it's real. Right? You have so much church division going on, and Paul, man, he's living it. And all he wants to do is just preach the gospel. All he wants to do is just see people come to know Jesus, give their life to him, live a life that is worthy of the calling of the gospel. And all Paul gets in return is he gets in prison, he gets beat up, he's shipwrecked a few different times, he's almost killed several different times, and here he is in prison, chained to a Roman guard. And the people outside, the Christian brothers, They're just seeking to afflict him. Some of them, not all of them, but they want to add affliction to his chains. It's like, man, he doesn't, I don't know, wouldn't that be rough? And some of us were like, man, my my life's hard. But what about Paul, man? Nothing in this letter does Paul say, man, it's hard. I want to give up and I don't want to do this anymore. I, I wanted to live for Jesus, but things didn't go my way. Paul's like, no, actually, it's good. It has served to advance the gospel. And really Paul's perspective is is if it advances the gospel, if it lifts Jesus up, I'm okay with it. If I'm going to be in prison and Jesus is lifted up, fine. If I'm going to be insulted and ridiculed and people are going to say things and slander my name, but Jesus is lifted up, I'm okay with it. If I am killed, we saw last week, it says to live is Christ, to die is gain. He's like, I'm fine with it as long as Jesus is lifted up. What a perspective, right? And then if you remember, we'll just kind of glance over the last couple verses of last week, verse 25. Paul's talking about how he want, you know, he's like, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I'm not sure what I want to do, you know? And he has this kind of moment um, where you're like, what are you saying, Paul? And really what he's saying is like, man, to live means fruitful labor. But he's like, I really, I really want to be with Jesus. Um, And he says, convinced of this, this is verse 25, I know that I will will remain 
and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. I just love his perspective. I'll go through this is almost what he's saying, the hard things for you. If it means that you'll get closer to Jesus, I'll welcome the persecution. I'll welcome the hatred. I'll welcome the chains. No, I don't want that in my life, right? But I will welcome it if it helps you to know Jesus. And he's like, I'll go through it for you, for your progress, for your joy in the faith. And it's so selfless, so sacrificial. And I just think when I'm reading through it, like, am I that way? Because I want to be like Jesus. That should be the goal when we're reading through Scripture, when we're walking with Jesus. We're like, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, we want to be like Jesus. He's trying to mold us and shape us and form us into the image of Christ. That's the goal, to be more like Jesus. And how do we do that? Well, we walk like Jesus. What did he do? Well, he was the most selfless person ever to live. Everything Jesus did had so much intention, and all the intention was on serving the people, not on himself. He wasn't trying to lift himself up. He knew he would be lifted up, but he's like, I'm serving you. He came to die. Paul is the same way. He's selfless, sacrificial. He sees it as an opportunity to serve people so that they can know Jesus. And so he goes on from this, verse 27, he says, only Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And I think it's interesting when he opens up and he says only, right? And what he's kind of saying here, because remember he said, I know it will turn out for my deliverance. I'm going to come for your progress and your joy and the faith. And like he's going to come see him again. And he's almost like, Remember, he's like, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What I shall choose, I don't know. And then he's like, I'm actually going to stay in the, the flesh because it's more necessary on your account to serve you so that you can grow more. And then he's almost giving some, what could we say, um, like he's making a deal in a sense. He's like, that's mine. I'll stay with you. I'll help you progress in the faith so that you can find joy, you can get stronger. But only this is your side of the bargain or, the, you know, the deal. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. If I'm going to stick around and I'm going to serve you, it's like you got to do something too. And it's not making an ultimatum, so it's not like, hey, do this or I'm out. But it's like he's, he's, what he's doing is he's holding them accountable. If I'm going to stick around and I'm going to serve you, i got to see that you're trying. i got to see that you're trying to get to know Jesus. You can't just show up and say, oh, God bless you, brother. How are you doing? Oh, I'm great. See you next week, right? It's like, Paul's like, I need you to want to know Jesus. Only let your, your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. If I'm going to stay here, then you got to live it. You can't just talk about it. And if you take notes, jot this down. There's a few points I'll make today, but this one's maybe the biggest. Faith in Jesus is shown by living for Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, I should be able to watch you. Like if I could watch a a replay of your last week, I should be able to tell by different actions and words and conversations you have that something's different. I think they're a Christian. You ever meet someone like that? You don't really know them, but they, like maybe you start a new job or you work and someone new comes on and they're they're different. Anybody this way? Like for me, I can sense it when there's a Christian. I'm like, I'm pretty sure they're a Christian. They're either a Christian or they're a Muslim. I don't know. Like, there's something, like, they have reverence for God. I don't know what it is yet, but I'm going to find out soon. You better believe it. It's like, but you can tell. If I watched your life last week, could I tell that you're a Christian? Would anybody else be able to tell, like, hey, they were living in a, a manner worthy of, of, of um, the gospel? Faith requires action. Right, Faith requires action. Faith or belief, and I know this is probably obvious, but sometimes it's like, yeah, I know the gospel. Like, you know the truth. You know about Jesus, but really that's what some people mean. Like, yeah, I've been to church. I know the gospel, but you don't know Jesus. You know, it's like faith and belief in Jesus means more than intellectual acknowledgement. 
right? You can, and this is a probably one that we can all relate to, intellectually acknowledging that eating healthy food will make you healthier does not make you fit or healthy, does it? Right? You go to your doctor, you're like, but I've read so many books on how to eat paleo and what's bad for me and all the fruits and vegetables. Oh, I'm even, I even got a book that tells me how to weigh all my food out, right? And then the doctor's like, well, are you doing it? Well, no, but I know it. Well, we're just going to have this conversation again next month when you come back with your different things that you want help fixing with, right? It's like it's the same thing. We're like, well, I know that I need to give my life to Jesus and I should live for Jesus. And it's like, but are you living for Jesus? Well, you know, I, I know the, the answer. I got the answer from the back of the book. It's Jesus, right? And you're like, yes, it's right, but you have to apply Jesus to your life, right? James says it the best, and you guys know this one probably, right? James 2, 17 says, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead, right? He's saying faith without works, faith without action is dead. It's useless is what he's saying, right? I know that might be strong, or if this is your first time to church, man, like you came on a strong day, but I believe the Lord knew you're coming, and this might just be just for you. I don't know, but faith without works, faith without action is no faith at all. That's really what he's saying. It's like, like knowing that eating healthy could make me healthier, but I'm not going to do anything. And the outcome is nothing changes. Nothing changes if we don't actually practice what we preach. And Paul here, he's saying, you gotta, if I'm going to be here, you got you to gotta live worthy. You got to practice what you preach. You got to live what you believe. You got to pursue what you proclaim. Because otherwise it's not going to work. Don't just talk about it. You got to be about it, right? And so he's, he's making this um, case that, man, you got to pursue Jesus, a manner of life worthy of the gospel. Don't just know about it, but know Jesus. Seek his presence. Seek his word, right? Some of you, how do I know Jesus? Well, his word for one, right? This is it. Like, this is God's word to us. You want to know what he thinks of you, what he, what he wants for you in this bigger general sense? Read the word. You want to know what he's done for you? Read his word. You want to know why the earth and the universe exists? Read his word. It tells us that in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And so you're like, well, where'd they come from? Well, right there, Genesis 1.1 came from God. God wanted to do it. God is a gangster. He does whatever he wants to do. He just made a world, made a whole universe, Right? People are like, I don't know, man, we've got all these things. No, very simple. We don't know how he did it. He's God. But he does what he wants to do. And so when you want to know Jesus, you know what he wanted to do? He wanted to record his word for us so we can study here today, 2,000 years later, after the last book was even written, so that we can read it, study it, learn it, know it, and not just know his word, but we can know him. It's pretty amazing. And on top of that, he's sent his Holy Spirit. And if you... If you repent and you believe, you confess Jesus as Lord, you receive the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden, you know what the Holy Spirit is? The Holy Spirit is our teacher. Where it's like, man, you know what? Philippians 1, 27 through 30 didn't ever make sense to me before. Then all of a sudden, you get the Holy Spirit, and it's like you got a pair of glasses on, and you can see clearly, and you're like, this makes sense now. It comes to life. God's Word, He wants you to know it. He wants you to read it, learn it, love it, live it. And so if you want to know Jesus, read his word, seek his presence, pray, all of that good stuff. But you can't, you can't change, you're not going to see any change if you don't change what you do. So he says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent... I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So he says, live in a manner worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, remember he's in prison now, he doesn't know them, he can't see them right now, he doesn't know all that's going on, but he's like, if I come and see you, it's going to be good, right? Right? I hope you're pursuing Jesus. But if I don't, I hope that you'd pursue Jesus anyways. I think of it this way that I used to work at a restaurant and we've all worked jobs with cell phones and where they're not allowed probably, right? 
like no texting at work, put your cell phone away, you're not allowed to be on, no electronics. Well, at this restaurant, everybody would be in the side station, right, when the manager's on the other side of the restaurant, he's at the front podium checking guests in, get him a table, whatever, we're over here texting real quick, it's like, hey, is he coming, right, and, and just let me know if he's coming. I was always the good person, like, I didn't break the rules too much, um, but like the one time I did it and like everybody else was on their phone constantly, you know what would happen? Yep, my manager come right through the door. Nick, come into my office. I'm like, are you serious? Everybody was right here texting and playing games and taking pictures, being silly. I text one three-word sentence, and you walk in, and now I, I'm getting written up. But you know, it's like, but what that shows is that I didn't respect him. And I know that's probably harsh in a way, right? You're like, well, I don't not respect him. There's one time in, in high school, senior year, this is like when cell phones first came out, maybe. I don't know. Um, right? Remember T9 texting? I love T9. Can we just go back to that? Because you can text and not break eye contact. Yeah, mm-hmm, right? But with, with the screen, you're like, what? Did, oops, I just messed up. Um, but anyways, my, my, um, one of my science teachers, he caught me on the phone. And man, you know what? It kind of broke me because I really did respect him. And when he caught me, I was like, dude, I am so sorry. Like, I'm embarrassed. But it, like, I never used my phone again in this class. But like here, Paul's saying, if I come and see you, I expect that you're doing good. You're trying to pursue living in a manner that's worthy of the calling of Jesus, in a wor- manner worthy of the gospel. But if I don't come, like the manager at the front podium, if I'm absent, I hope that you would still pursue Jesus. And I think we've got to understand that because life with Jesus, it's very much a community, but life with Jesus is individual. Right? It's like, are you going to follow Jesus? no matter what. Not if everybody else around you is there, you know, your pastor's there, your friend's there, your whoever is all there. Yeah, I'll pursue Jesus when everybody's together. No, will you pursue Jesus? All right, I remember there was a friend that I had, and I felt as if I was, in a way, like the one that could keep them close to Jesus. And I realized it's like, I can't do that. And it's like, they have to come to knowledge and faith in Jesus. Like literally, I'm trying like, oh, well, if I just keep, you know, hanging out with them and inviting them over and whatever, it's like they'll eventually give their lives to Jesus and I'm the one keeping them from going off the deep end or whatever. But I had to realize I can't save anybody. Just like I said earlier, I want to give everything to Jesus. I would just be like, hey, everybody here today, we're giving our lives to Jesus, but I can't make that decision for you. But what I know is that if I just give it over to God, I can't do anything with your guys' hearts per se. I can try to lead you, but it's like I give it over to God. God will do what he wants to do, and he is a better keeper of your hearts than I can try to be, right? And it's like, so as I'm trying to keep them from going off the deep end, I feel like they had to almost go off the deep end to find God by me trying to keep them from it, you know? And anyways, it's like, we just got to see this, is that it's a personal relationship. So are you going to follow Jesus? If all your friends reject Jesus, if everything goes bad in your life, are you going to follow Jesus? Because that will show you if you're real or not. If, if everything goes to waste, are you going to follow Jesus? Are you going to praise his name? You know how hard it is to praise Jesus' name when things aren't good? And I'm sure, I know there's people here today who know far harder things than me. But there's one thing, when, and many of you know our story, our youngest, Judah, when he was first born, he was taken right to the NICU right away, barely got to hold him. Amber didn't get to hold him for eight or more hours, and even when she did, it was just for a second, and be very careful, we got to put him back, don't touch him, any of that stuff, right? Well, we didn't know if we would get out of there with him. We didn't know if he'd make it out. It was a scary time, many of you know about it. And you know what we did? One of my friends, oh man, um, I love him to death because he did it. He reached out. You know, and I knew that he'd been through similar things. And his daughter was in the NICU for like two or three months. Judah, at the end of it all, was about two weeks or so. And so he knew more than I knew. You know, and I asked him, I said, when I was a pastor, like he was born while we were here doing church and ministry, right? And my friend was a pastor. And I just asked, I said, were you angry at God? Because I just wanted to know, like, am I the only one here? Am I wrong for this? Because I don't know. Am I, were you angry with God? And he said, yeah, I was. He's like, but I quickly realized how foolish it was that, that my daughter, for him, is God's daughter. And, and for me, is like, my son is his son. And then he told me, he's like, you know what we did? He's like, we just played worship music. 
And you know what the last thing I wanted to do in that hospital room was? Let's play worship music. It wasn't that I didn't believe. I believed in God for sure, like 100%. I didn't understand anything he's doing. Even to this day, I can almost like, I don't know why you took us there, but you did. And I didn't want to do it, but you know what? I think the Holy Spirit inside of me and Amber, like we were crying, ugly crying too. I don't even like to cry. Like I try to be cool, like, oh, yeah, you know, a little dust in the eye cry. (laughs) But there's times when you just can't do it. And we played this song, and my goodness, we cried. We cried and we praised the Lord. You know how hard it is to praise God in the storm? Like when things don't make sense, when you're like, you almost, like you're mad at God. Why would you do this? I love you. I've given everything to you. It's like, and so that's when things get real. Do you believe in Jesus? Are you willing to live a life worthy of the gospel in the good days? It's super easy when the good days, oh, everything's great. No problems, smooth sailing. Everybody loves Jesus and it's great. But what about the bad days? Will you still serve him? Will you still give your all to him? Will you still seek him and say, God, I don't know why you're doing this. It hurts for me quite literally. It hurts like hell. I don't understand. There's a song, a Hillsong song that said that even when it hurts like hell, I'll praise you. And I'm just like, that's me right now. But I'm like, I'm going to praise you because I know you're real. I know you're true. I know you have a plan. I know you can work all things together for good. I don't know how it's going to happen. I'm going to trust you. Will you trust Jesus like that? Life with Jesus is personal. You have to make a personal commitment to follow him. And he's saying, live a life worthy of the gospel. Live a life worthy of the gospel so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, that I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. A couple other points I want to make out today. Number one is that what's required to, make, to live a life worthy of the gospel is, number one, is loyalty to Jesus. In the conference the last couple of days, one of the teachers, Ed Taylor, he talked about loyalty, and he had all kinds of great um, Bible verses I'm not, I don't have time to go into today, but he said this, that serving Jesus for a long period of time requires wholehearted commitment, not a half-hearted effort. And I think we would all say, yeah, of course, amen, right? But again, when times get tough, are you going to follow him? When things don't make sense, are you going to praise his name? Right, loyalty to Jesus. That's what's required, number one, to live a life worthy of the gospel. Is that what I mean is you got to have wholehearted commitment to Jesus, not half in, half out. I lived that life for a long time. I've always believed in Jesus. My mom's here today. Um, I, she's usually online. Welcome, mom. We love you. We're glad to have you. Um, but she can attest to this. I always loved God. I always believed in God. I never questioned it. I just look at creation as a kid, not knowing anything really about the Bible. But I'm like, God made that. That bird singing on my window, like God made that, right? And God's there. He's hearing me. I don't understand it, but I, I, I believe it. And the more I learned about God, the more I even experienced creation. I'm like, man, it's clear. It's evident that there's a God, that there's a creator. This stuff doesn't just happen. Life doesn't just happen by chance, right? It's like, but I've always loved God. But then there was a time I walked away from God. Maybe like some of you, you get, you stumble into some sins that you weren't planning on doing, right? And for me, junior high is like, I had some friends. They started doing drugs and I was 12, I think, years old. And me and my friends, we smoked weed for the first time, seventh grade. Right? It's like I wasn't planning on doing it, but they did it. And you know what that did? It opened up a door that was like, you know what? We didn't die. Uh, I mean, you're right when you're a kid. You're like, we're going to die. You smoke a cigarette, you're going to die. You smoke weed, you're going to die. You're going to go to hell. God's going to strike you with lightning. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm not willing to take a chance. But then I took the chance, and I'm like, I didn't die. It wasn't that bad. And then I kept going down that road because Satan starts to sell me this lie that it's okay. God wants you to have fun. He wants you to have friends, and these are your friends in your life, and they care about you. And you start going down that road, and then smoking weed starts to drinking, and you can just go down that rabbit trail. And I lived the life of half in, half out. I believe in God, but I am serving and living for myself and and for the world. Let me tell you, it's the most miserable life to have. Right, you think that it might be hard. Suffering for Jesus is hard. At least you're suffering with purpose. When you're suffering half in, half out, you're suffering for yourself for no good. There's no benefit other than you're just being stubborn. I just want what I want, Lord, and you're just going to suffer. You're going to be miserable because the most miserable person in the world is the one who knows the truth but refuses to live it. 
And I can tell you that from firsthand experience. Nothing will bring you joy. You think that some other new drug that your friends bring over will bring you joy, or that other person, maybe you get in a relationship, hook up with them, they're going to give you joy, or we're going to go to this party. But you just wake up in the morning with regret. It never changes, does it? Those of you who know this, you think, oh, this is going to be awesome. And even it is somewhat awesome, right? The Bible says sin is enjoyable for a time, but you reap a pretty heavy consequence the next day when you wake up and you're like, why did I do that? I shouldn't have done that. I should have just went home. I should have said no. I should have said I'm busy. You should have just came to fervent church, right, or whatever. Like for me, it was like, should have just went to youth group, but I did what I wanted to do. And then you'll reap those benefits. Again, that or the consequences of those things. It's the most miserable place to be. So if you're going to give your life to Jesus, you give your whole heart. Say, here I am, all in for Jesus. Number two, what's required to live a life worthy of the gospel is unity with one another. So number one, you've got to have loyalty with, for, with Jesus. You're giving him it all, your heart. I'm here. I surrender it all to you. Whatever you want, Lord, right? There has to be that moment in your life, right? If you haven't had that moment where you're like, here I am, Jesus. I believe in you. I repent of my sins, and I want to turn from my sins to live for you. I would question if you're even a Christian or not. You might be the intellectual one who knows the truth intellectually, but you're not practicing it. So I'd say, I don't know if you're really there yet. But if you have loyalty to Jesus, the second thing we should have is unity with one another. Why do I say that? He says it right here. I, whether I come or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. There's not multiple spirits, right? I, of course, there's evil spirits. We could say that, I suppose. But one spirit. There's one spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Right? we got to be standing firm. Standing firm in one spirit. We're not budging. But you know what that means? Number one is like if we want to be unified, we want to be united, we have to have loyalty to Jesus. We have to. It's not even like, and I know that's a no-brainer, but like if you come in, you're like, oh, I want to be united, right? But then you have some other like idea or thing, like I think we should do this or, or whatever. It's just some weird theology and you get off track. It's like, no, like there's only one spirit. And Jesus might speak other things. We're one body with many members, right? But it's all going to make sense. God is not the author of confusion. So like if you're not loyal to Jesus, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, man, you're going to come in and be like, you know what I think would be really awesome? If we started a men's group at the bar on Friday nights, you know, and we're like, that just doesn't work. That's not, that's not his plan. That's not his will. It's not his desire, right? He doesn't want you to do that. He doesn't want a stumbling block in your life or anybody else's life. So we have to have loyalty to Jesus. Then we have unity with one another. I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's rather lengthy, I'll admit. But if you want to open your Bibles there, you can, or we'll try to get it on the screen. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. This is us, the body of Christ, right? He says, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So it doesn't matter if you're Jewish, if you're a Gentile, like you've come to Jesus, you're, there's only one way. There's only one door in, there's only one spirit. Verse 14, it says, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Um, verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? As it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. I won't read the rest of it there that I gave you, Louis, but he... Paul's saying here to the church of Corinth, there's one body, but we're many members, all right? It's very obvious what he's saying, but some people are like, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm a foot. I'm a pinky toe. Well, I don't really play any, any worth here, but you know what? Go home, cut your pinky toe off, and see if it doesn't hurt the rest of your body, right? It's like, so even if you're a pinky toe, you got a purpose to play, 
Right? And you know what's kind of a cool illustration in a way? I mean, for one, has everyone stubbed your pinky toe before on something? Um, it's the worst. That's one way, too. We can be like, hey, are you a Christian? Let's stub your pinky toe into the, um, the dresser and see what words come out. <laughs> um, no. But anyway, so you, you stub your pinky toe or you break it. How do we fix it? Your pinky toe can't fix itself. You come down with your hands, with your eyes, looking at it, or a doctor does, and you repair it, right? In the same way, when somebody's hurting, whatever part of the body you play, it's like the other people are there to help to build you up, to help heal you, to help carry your burden. It's like we're one body, many members. Right? It's like we can't all be the, the preacher, pastor on Sunday morning. Right? It's just not going to work that way. It's going to be weird. It's going to be out of order. We're going to be like, what's going on? And the Bible, Paul even says that in the Bible. Like, don't be doing that because then a non-believer is going to come in and be like, y'all are crazy. It um, doesn't make any sense. He's like having order there. It's like we can't all play the same role. But you got to understand you have a role to play. You have a role to play. And so when we come together, because we have loyalty in Jesus, we're, we're committed fully, all in, ride or die for Jesus, then we can have unity as one body, playing our part, no, whatever, however big, however small it may be, one body in Christ. And then um, number three, we go on, he says, um, well, he goes on, he says, not frightened in anything by your opponents. Because right, you're going to come together, you're going to be standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, you're going to be serving Jesus. You're not going to be frightened in anything by your opponents. And he says, this is a clear sign to them, this is the opponents, the enemies, the non-believers, of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. He says, don't be frightened by the non-believers. Right? I know when you first start out, you're like, hey, I want to be a Christian. It's, it's scary, because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what that means. You don't know what God's purpose is. You don't know how to operate even in the Holy Spirit. And let me just say that we're all learning every single day. Nobody has it all down. So if you're scared, you're not alone. We've all been there. But it's like sometimes we're scared. Well, what are other people going to think of me? They're going to hate me. I'm going to lose friends. The truth is you might. You probably will even. Right? The people that were closest to you, you thought loved you, cared about you, once you give your life to Jesus and you stop going, say, to the bar on Friday nights with them, they're going to stop calling you because they, I mean, for one, and I've experienced this, they stop calling you. And I don't think it's because they don't care about you. I think it's because they don't want some buzzkill around who's only talking about Jesus, not getting drunk and high with them anymore. And I think that's really what it was. And like that very verse comes true where it's like, I'm not here, they don't call me over here anymore because it's a clear sign of their sin and how they should be living, but it's a clear sign of my salvation and my hope in Jesus Christ, right? And so he's like, don't be scared of them. And so number three, right, so loyalty in Jesus, number two is that we're going to be united as one body. Number three is we've got to contend for the faith. This is another thing that one of the pastors this past week talked about is Jude, and there's only one chapter, but verse 3 where he says, I wanted to write to you of, of some great happy things, but he's like, I wanted to, that's my paraphrase, but he says, I wanted to, I have to write to you to contend for the faith, which means you got to fight, which means it's going to be hard and difficult. So I got to tell you today, you give your loyalty to Jesus, I'm all in, ride or die, Jesus, united with one another, and you got to be prepared to go to war. Soldier of Christ. Um, I wrote this one down, uh, well, 1 Timothy 6.12, talks about, this is Paul telling Timothy, it's basically an older pastor to a younger pastor, he says, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. It's like faith in Jesus is going to require some fight. We're not fighting for salvation. It's already been won, right? His atoning work is done. He said it is finished. But it's going to require a fight because Satan's going to want to trip you up and make you feel like you made a mistake, right? It's like, well, I gave my life to Jesus and all my friends left me. Maybe I made a mistake. No, you didn't make a mistake. You're loyal to Jesus. And you're going to find new friends as you become united in one, in one body of Christ, right? And then you're going to fight and contend. Not for just yourself. You're going to fight for one another. You're going to fight to proclaim the gospel. And I love what he says to Timothy. He says, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, right? You got to take hold of it. Jesus is like, hey, here it is, but you got to do something. You got to have actions there. You got to take hold of it. He says this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. So still Paul writing Timothy. 
um, just a, the second letter. He says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He says this, verse 3, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And I love that. I love it because it says it all right there. You're a soldier of Christ Jesus. You believe in Jesus, you're loyal to Jesus. You have to think of it as a military mindset. Some of those of you who have been in the military, you'll understand it. Those of you who don't, you've got to just picture it, right? Marines, Army, um, guys, Navy, Air Force. Sorry, I don't know all those terms because I wasn't in there. But they're committed, they get deployed, they go overseas, and they're like, hey, we need to go to war, we got to go drop bombs on people, we got to shoot guns and stuff, and we're protecting stuff. It's not like, oh, I don't know, man, that's a little intense, I didn't sign up for this. Like, No, your loyalty has to be there, because your loyalty has to be there, you have to be united with your other brothers and sisters who are over there fighting, and you got to contend as a good soldier. Nothing would be more frightening if you were on the front lines and like the guy next to you is just scared to death and he takes off running and leaves you, right? We can't have that here. And I'll promise you this, that for me, it's like I'm going to be there for you guys as much as I possibly can. And I ask that you guys would be there for me and everyone sitting around you, everyone tuning in online, like, hey, we're going to be there. When shots start going off, we're here with you. We don't know what's going to happen. It hurts. It's crazy, but we're here. We're loyal to Jesus. We're united with each other, and we're going to contend because we're not going to back down. Jesus didn't back down. He didn't give up. He endured, and he says, share in suffering as a good soldier. He says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. You can't get entangled and bothered and distracted by worldly things. There's a battle, there's a war at hand. And very much so in the Christian life, as we see here. And he says this, this is um, the fourth one. He um, says to, to contend, right? Verse uh, 28, not frightening anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God, and he says this, verse 29, for it has been granted to you. The word granted is like, hey, it's been gifted to you. And at first, you're like, oh, you got a gift for me, right? And if you have kids, right, whenever we're like, we got something for you, like their eyes light up, right? But here, check out this verse. This is what God has for you, and it might not be so exciting, but I want you to be assured at the end of this whole thing that it is good. He says it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Number four is that, right, we have loyalty to Jesus, united together, contend for the faith. Number four is that it's an honor to suffer for Jesus. And you need to start seeing it that way. Paul sees it that way. Why can he say that, hey, it's a good thing. It served to advance the gospel because he says it's an honor to suffer for Jesus. It's an honor to suffer for my king. And I know it's hard. That's not something you want to hear. You didn't come to church today to hear about suffering, right? Maybe Jesus suffering so that you could not suffer, but you got to understand part of the call, part of believing in Jesus, loyalty to Jesus is you're going to have warfare and there's going to be, there's going to be some hard things that you got to go through. You're going to suffer. There's going to be times, like I said, you'll lose friends, there's going to be times when you're, I mean, there's all kinds of things we can go this route, right? There's people literally in the Middle East who get beheaded for their faith in Jesus, right? That talk about suffering for Jesus, but it's like, it's an honor. When Paul says to live is Christ, to die is gain, it doesn't matter what happens to me. It's an honor to live for Christ. It's an honor to die for Christ because I will be with Christ. And if we can start to grasp that, man, it's an honor. I don't like it. But God, I know that you're bigger than this. And if you can see it in, in God's perspective, God knows all things. We said it earlier. He knew every one of your days before there was even one of them. And if he knows all of them, he knows what's going to happen. He knows the hard things that are going to come in. He knows the sinful things that you're going to do and people around you are going to do that are going to hurt you and, and cause you to fall and stumble and suffer to a degree. But you got to know if God has allowed things, that's like there's a purpose. Nothing happens without God knowing about it. And that might be hard, too, because you're like, well, why would God let evil go on in the world, right? God is a God who's given us freedom. 
and he's given us the gospel, right? He's given us salvation, right? He doesn't want it to be this way, but he wants us to choose him, to turn from our sins, to choose him. And so anyways, it's an honor to suffer for Jesus. He says it's been granted to you. It's a gift. It's a special privilege, right? Suffering as a non-believer doesn't really serve any purpose, it right, talks about in one of the Bible, uh, books of the Bible where the, those who don't have any hope, man, they, they, when they grieve, they grieve with no hope. But us Christians, believers, we grieve as they do. You lose someone, you cry, you grieve, you mourn, but we do with hope that this isn't the end. Death isn't the, the end of the story, right? So to suffer is a gift. It's a privilege for Jesus' sake. Suffering for Jesus is never in vain, right? It's not in vain. It's, it's an honor. It's a privilege. And I want to say, um, this is one of the, I forget who wrote this, but he says, we shouldn't just accept the fact that we may suffer for Christ, but we should embrace it, right? It's like, if you're a soldier, like, well, we might go to war. It's like, honestly, I think a lot of people sign up to be a soldier because they want to go to war. Like, oh, don't send me. I'll go, right? I don't know, maybe some of you don't feel that way. Um, but if I was in the Marines, I'd be like, yo, I have signed up. I got this gun. Let's go use it. See what happens. Um, I want to go to war. And so we should just think, when you give your life to Jesus, you're entering a spiritual war that is unlike anything we've ever seen on this earth. You think the earth's bad. You think stuff going on in Israel is crazy and sad. Like there's a spiritual battle raging all over. And, and just if we could see it over Israel, it, I bet you'd be pretty crazy in the spiritual realm, the angels, demons, things going on there. It's like, but we got to understand that if we're loyal to Jesus, we're united with one another, we're contending for the faith, we will also suffer at times. And we shouldn't just say, well, we might suffer. We should just embrace it. Yeah, it's going to happen. And I'm going to face it. It might be hard, but I'm going to glorify Jesus. I'm going to praise his name. Or maybe with tears in your eyes, Maybe weeping, sad, right? Maybe you're angry in your heart, but you're like, but God, I know you're real and you're true, so I'm going to praise your name anyways because my feelings aren't matching with my faith, but I'm going to use my faith to say you're good. And so we're going to suffer and we're going to embrace it. And there's going to be good days. I'm not here to get you down. You're like, man, life is going to be really bad. No, there's going to be good days. There's joy in it too when you're like, man, yeah, that was hard. But then all of a sudden you hear someone who's encouraged through your suffering. I can't believe you've been through that. I shared with you a few weeks ago a pastor I love to listen to, Levi Lusco. Right? He lost his daughter to asthma attack. And to me, it's like I couldn't imagine that. But it's like to me to look to him, I'm like, I am encouraged. I find strength that you can persevere, that me and my little trials. Right? To him, he's probably, Nick, you, are you kidding me? Like, you're going to be fine, right? NICU doctors are the best, by the way. I just want to say that. If you're a NICU nurse, doctor, praise God for you because they're just so sweet and amazing. But in the moment, you don't know how what's going to happen. But anyways, I look to someone who's been through greater, harder things, and it strengthens me. And I hope that like someone, if one of you are here today, you've gone through some hard things, it's like you could be a great encouragement to someone else where it's like, like we might not ever be through something, but when we know that you have... We're like, I think I can make it through my little petty suffering and trials that I think are so hard. Suffering has a purpose. God doesn't waste any pain. God uses everything. He has a purpose, a plan in it. And so again, just embracing suffering, it's an honor to serve Jesus. It's also an honor to suffer for his name because the gospel is going forward. Remember, Paul says it's a good thing. I welcome the chains, the people who are going to slander me and gossip about me. He's like, I praise Jesus because the gospel's proclaimed, right? He doesn't, he's not upset about himself, but here's a few things in wrapping up. We're, this is quite a lot, actually, a lot of scripture, Louis, so I hope you're ready. Um, but Ephesians chapter 4, if you want to write some of this down, these are other verses where Paul tells other people to also live in a manner worthy of the gospel, Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is writing to a church at Ephesus, right? So Paul was a church planner. He's involved in much ministry all over the place. And he writes this, Ephesians 4, verse 1 through 6, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. Very common theme. Paul's often a prisoner, but even when he's not, he's like, I'm a slave to Jesus. My life is for him. I'm loyal to Jesus. He says, 
I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And here's some keys. Well, how do I do that? With all humility. We're not boastful. We're not prideful. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. I'm a humble servant because I don't, I've, I've messed up so many times. I don't deserve it. I'm just here to serve. With all humility, with gentleness. He says, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 through 12, Paul's writing to the church at Thessalonica. He says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, while well, we proclaim the gospel to you, to, her, to you, the gospel of God. Verse 10, you are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I just love that. It's like God has called you to walk in a manner worthy. So start walking. Uh, Colossians 1, verse 9, Paul's writing the church at Colossae. He says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, he says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. I got to pause there because it's like when we're walking in a manner worthy or we're at least pursuing it, it can get tiring. But we got to have endurance. We got to contend. We got to have perseverance. And he says here, you're going to be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. As you walk, Jesus is going to give you the power to keep going. As you pursue faith, he's going to give you the power, the ability to actually do it. He says, so walk in a uh, manner worthy. He says, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So the whole purpose of this message that I want you to get today if you haven't got it yet, if you're a Christian, live a life that is worthy of the gospel. There's some simple ways where you can say, well, how do I know if I'm living it? Well, I think it's very clear if you're not, right? Let's turn here. This one's not in my notes, but Galatians 5. Louis, if you want to. Galatians 5. You want to talk like, well, how do we know if we are or we aren't walking in a way that's worthy well, verse 16, Galatians chapter 5 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And we'd say, well, yeah, I get that. Obviously, evil and good, they don't go together. It's like water and vinegar, right? But he says, um, are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Verse 18, he says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. How do I know if I'm not living a life worthy of the calling of the gospel? Well, some of these words, although this is not an exhaustive list to say this is everything, some of these words might describe you, or may, hopefully it describes who you used to be. But he says this, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality Right? That's not just like the stuff where you're like, oh, only crazy people do that. Like sexually immoral, sex before marriage, right? pornography, things of that nature, sexual immorality. It says impurity, sensuality. That's a word that's used to, it's sensuality, like you're pursuing, and I think that it could be very much drugs, pharmakeia, right? Even that word there, it's like, it's like drugs are something that we pursue to have a sensual experience, right? We want to feel better. I think that's in here. He says, idolatry, putting anything above God. doesn't even matter if it's good. You're like, man, I just love doing, like, 
playing the box at, on a band, right? So you just, I want to do that, right, with all, everything I got. But it's idolatry if it's above Jesus. It says idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, right? You're like, well, maybe the sexual immorality and sensuality didn't feel like it hit, but maybe some of these do, right? Strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness. Yes, being drunk is a sin. It's in the Bible, right? So when people are just like, oh, you know, God wants me to be happy. And I used to be there. I used to be like, oh, Jesus made water into wine. It's fine. No, but he didn't make water into wine so everybody can be doing a keg stand on it, right? And getting, um, like, we, we stretch it. But he says, drunkenness, it's a work of the flesh, orgies and things like these. He says, I warn you. This is Paul again. This is the church of Galatia. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if any of those describe your life, your day-to-day -day life, and how you pursue life, like you have to understand that there's some pretty heavy words there that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You're not living a life worthy of the gospel. And that's got to be concerning. It was for me. When I was living that, I'm like, man, that describes my Friday night. Right? It's like all those things. It's like, seriously, that used to be me. But if you're in that place, it's like there is no assurance of hope, of faith, of salvation. If I were to die tonight, would I wake up in heaven? Right? When I was a rebellious, prodigal son type person and getting high and doing that stuff, if I would have died, I really think that I would not have had salvation because all of that described me. It wasn't just that I did it once. That's what he says here. Those who practice such things. Like this is your lifestyle. Not that you messed up once because you can repent of it. But if it's something that describes you like, yeah, I'm... I party. I like to party. Whatever. It's like, that's when you should be concerned there. And for me, that's what described my life back then. And I don't think there would have been hope, but I love that he says this, but the fruit of the Spirit. How can I know if I am walking in, in a manner worthy? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Right? This is agape love, unconditional love. It's loyalty love, where it's like, it doesn't matter. I'm here. I'm here, Jesus. Ride or die. Love. Right? And it's not just love towards Jesus, because Jesus says you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second greatest commandment is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So it's like once you got this down, hey, I'm God, I love you, you love me, I got that. Now he's like, go love other people. Show them my love unconditionally. Not if they deserved it. Oh, if someone was nice to you, it's like the Bible says anyone can be nice and loving to people who love them. He's like, go love those who hate you. Pray for those who persecute you, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, right? Joy is not happiness. You got to understand that happiness is like a worldly term, if you ask me. Happiness is a feeling. Joy is like a position. It's like, I'm, I know God's going to do this. It's going to turn out for my good. I, I know I'm, can, um, suffering is an honor for Jesus kind of thing, where there's joy in it because I know there's purpose in it. I can have joy that it's going to be all right. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are things that would be evident in your life, or at least starting to be. You know, and this takes time. It's fruit of the Spirit. Just think of it, if you have a garden at home, if you're trying to grow fruit quite literally, it takes time. You don't just plant a seed and you're like, tomorrow you want an avocado. It just doesn't work that way. It takes like five years to have that thing sp sprout a root, Right? This is true. My wife is trying to grow one yet again. Um, so, but um, fruit takes time. The, the seed's planted, right? It's like, man, I got the Holy Spirit. But it's going to take some time because he's got to clean up some of that mess in there. Right? He's got to rewire you in a big degree where you're like, man, I used to do this and got all these habits and addictions. And God's going to, he's going to rewire you, but it takes some time. And Here's the thing I said it last week. If you're like, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus, but I want to clean myself up before I, I do that, that's not the right approach. The approach is to say, I'm broken, I'm dead, I'm my sins, I can't do it on my own. Here I am, and He will, he will rewire you. He'll start to teach you all of these things, and then one day you'll start to be able to say, man, I got more self-control than I did five years ago. It wasn't just a day for me where all of a sudden I had self-control. There was a big piece of my life, years, where I couldn't hang out with certain friends. Friends I loved. Friends I've known forever, but because they were getting drunk and high, and I knew I didn't have self-control. If I go there, I know it's going to happen. Some of you, you know that, right? 
It's like you got to just stop being foolish. Like, oh, I, every time I go there, I just end up getting drunk and doing something stupid. It's like, well, stop going there. Right? So I just had to do that one day where I'm just, I can't hang out with you guys. I love you. I can't do it. Not, no offense to you. I'm too weak. But you know, years later, I, I can go back and I can go see him. And I'm like, I have self-control now where that stuff doesn't even tempt me anymore. But it took time. And it's not to say that I've accomplished it and I'll, I'll never struggle. But it's like literally I have more self-control today than I did when I first started and first believed. And Jesus will do the same in you. You'll have more love 10 years from now, hopefully, than you do today. You'll have more faith. You'll have more joy, more peace, more self-control, more gentleness, more faithfulness. It'll be good. But you got to pursue it. And I'll just, I guess I'll end with this. Verse 24, he says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus, this is Galatians chapter 5, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its, its passions and desires. And he says this, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And I love that because it's like, keep in step. I feel like it's like God's like, hey, I'm going somewhere. You want to come? Well, you got to keep up. Yeah, like, keep in step. Don't get lazy on me. Don't get lazy on me. Don't be like, oh, I believe in you, but you don't actually do what you believe. He's like, keep in step with me. Keep in step with me. You're going to see great things. You're going to go through some hard things, but don't worry. I'm there with you. I haven't left you. I won't forsake you. I'm going to give you the power to get through it. I'm going to give you a new perspective to see that I'm going to do something through it. And so, again, the message title, Worthy, Live a Life That's Worthy of the Gospel. And I think to do that, you've got to understand the gospel. And if you want a more full picture of it, I don't have a whole lot of time today, but go watch the first or second study, I think it was the first one, of our Philippians series, because you got to understand the gospel to understand Paul and what he's trying to say. And if you want to live a life that's worthy, if you understand the gospel, I really believe that you will want to live a life that's worthy of the gospel, because you're like, he did that for me. He, he's called me. That's the thing, too. He says this. He's like, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Jesus says that one time to the disciples. And I find so much comfort in that, too, because it's like the same thing with us. You didn't choose him. It says that we love him because he first loved us. He chose you. He's appointed you. And what I love about it, this one guy said this, maybe it was yesterday, even at this conference. He's like, if he's appointed you, God has, like nobody can take that from you. Like if he's called you to something, nobody can take that call. And that's God's calling for you. And you didn't choose it. He chose it for you. It's almost like go walk in a manner worthy. Go do what he's called you to do. Do it to the best of your ability and do it to the glory of God. Right? Jesus says that they might see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. It's not our glory, it's his. And so live, in a, life, live a life that is worthy of the gospel, which takes loyalty to Jesus, wholehearted commitment, united with one another in one spirit, the Holy Spirit. Contend for the faith and remember it's an honor to suffer for Jesus not always easy, not always pleasant, but it is, it will be worth it, right? And I think one day, too, when we go through this, um, it, when we see Jesus, this is what Paul says. Paul, again, I think has more things to complain about than anybody else, but he says the present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. If Paul can say that, I mean, I hope we can, too. This hard thing that I'm going through right now, this hard circumstance, right? It, it just seems hard, overwhelming. I don't know how I'm going to get through it, but it's not even worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. When we see Jesus, we're going to be like, man, that was, that was easy <laughs> almost. It's not even worth comparing to how good it was. This is, it's worth it, worthy. Live a life that is worthy of the gospel. Amen.